Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Peace Islands New York uh, event. We have the pleasure of hosting uh, Paul Moses for uh, our uh, talk uh, this evening. And the talk is called Crossing the Barriers, How New York's Irish and Italians Overcame Their Rivalry and Learned to Love Each Other. Paul Moses is Professor Emeritus of Journalism at Brooklyn College and a former reporter and editor at Newsday. He's the author of The Saint and the Sultan, The Crusades, Islam and Francis of Assisi's Mission of Peace, and also uh, the author of An Unlikely Union, The Love-Hate Story of New York's Irish and Italians, which is what today's presentation is based around. He's a contributing writer at the uh, Commonwealth magazine and writes for other outlets such uh, as well, most recently including The Daily Beast, uh, CNN.com, and Documented NY. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife, Maureen. Welcome, Paul. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And I might add to everyone, you'll have the opportunity to uh, ask questions via the YouTube chat box. And of course, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube, please do so, uh, as well as uh, various links we're going to share in the chat box. Please subscribe to our uh, email to get future notifications. So with that out of the way, thank you again, Paul. Welcome. Well, thanks very much, Emre. I'm very happy to uh, to be here with you and with, with everyone else um, and, and to be with Peace Islands Institute. I think the theme of the book really is pretty close to the work that you do, but we'll maybe we'll develop that as we, mm -hmm. as we go along. Uh, so as Emre said, I've written a book about the relations between the Irish and the Italians in New York. And at bottom, I think it's really a book about peacemaking, uh, about how rival ethnic groups uh, or racial groups can overcome uh, animosity that seems to come with tribalized urban life. Um, you might not think it today, but at one time, these two massive immigrant groups clashed bitterly in New York and in other big cities. Today, I think they're to most people kind of indistinguishable. Um, in politics, for example, we've referred to a, a white Catholic vote um, in New York for decades. Nobody would have said that. They would have said the Italian vote or the Irish vote, uh, two of the biggest blocks uh, in New York City um, in the uh, 20th century. Peace has been made, and I like to talk about how that happened. Um, I should say I have a personal interest in that piece um, since I am, uh, my ancestry is half Italian. I have two uh, grandparents who were born in Southern Italy, one in Calabria and the other in Basilicata. Um, and my wife Maureen's ancestry is Irish. Uh, at one time in the last century, uh, a marriage like that, ours like ours, would have upset one or both families. Uh, fortunately, that wasn't the case for us. And we're at this point married for 41 years. Um, first, let me say a little bit about how the Irish and the Italians met. Um, the Irish got here first uh, and came in especially big numbers in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, they were fleeing a famine that killed a million people. Um, and we know that Maureen's great grandmother uh, grew up in what was the most impoverished part of Ireland, uh, County Donegal in the Northwest. And this, that woman, her name was uh, Margaret Gallagher. She was born in 1860. And I, I kind of looked into the history of that um, just to get a sense for what drove the Irish to come to this country. And uh, a few years before she was born, um, uh, the British landlord of the uh, farm that she lived on, uh, made supposed improvements in the area that resulted in the loss of a common uh, grazing area, which, which had been a tradition. Um, and, and because the people, they released these very small plots of land and grow potatoes there. And then they had the grazing area where everybody could graze their cows or, or sheep. Um, and the loss of that was very devastating. And I, I'd like to just read one short thing I found. Uh, it was the subject of some, some public hearings at the time. So I actually was able to get some good information on that. Um, so her ancestors' names were uh, Manus Gallagher and Mary McFadden. 
They lived in a hamlet in which 50 of the 70 families resorted to eating seaweed to maintain a diet of two meals a day. Uh, seaweed was not considered a delicacy then. Um, without enough grazing land, the farmers had to give up their cattle. James McGinley went from 14 cows to four in three years. Patrick McFad McFadden went from six cows to none. Only 14 of the 70 families had beds. Edward McGarvey lacked not only a bed, but he had no blanket. About half the families had no shirts. The widow, Margaret McBride, sold her gown to pay the higher rent. Many of the women would not leave their huts because their torn clothing exposed them to shame. Testifying in 1858 before a House of Common Inquiry, Commons Inquiry, the local priest, Father James Doherty, said he excused many families from attending Sunday Mass because despite their deep devotion, they had not sufficient clothing to come out. Um, and that kind of just gives us a little idea of the push factors that, that push the Irish to come to New York in big numbers. Um, kind of a, a combined poverty, but sort of tied in with, the, with their political impotence. You know, they, 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 they were at the will of the, uh, of the, of the English and, and that in this particular case led the uh, landlord to make some so-called improvements that made life a lot worse. Um, the Italians uh, started arriving in large numbers around 1880. So that's you know, quite a few years later. Um, they have political problems also that, that, that pushed them. Uh, in their case, it's a little different. Um, they had actually overthrown their colonial domination, whereas the, the Irish had, were unable to at that point. Um, but the, and, and they finally succeeded with that, uh, their revolution called the Risorgimento concluded in, in 1870 with the uh, conquering of Rome from the, from the Pope. Um, but they also had, they had to overthrow uh, Spanish and French and Austrian um, domination of, of much of Italy. The new government that formed was really um, uh, dominated by the Northern part of Italy and it, it, it drained out a lot of the resources from the South in different ways, sometimes through taxation. Uh, and anyway, it made life already very bad, even worse. Uh, and so people were in a culture that really emphasized staying close to your family, made you know, millions of people migrate in what, uh, one of the largest migrations in history, first to North Africa, to Tunisia, then to Latin America, uh, Argentina mainly, and finally um, to the United States, mainly New York. So, you know, um, uh, my, uh, my ancestors came over in that, in that migration. Now, 1880, when this really started happening, uh, was the same year that the first Irish Catholic mayor of New York was elected. His name was William R. Grace. He was a shipping businessman. Uh, and and his, I guess his family is still, still around. Um, and the Irish faced tremendous prejudice themselves, partly because of their, their religion, right? Um, if, I'll give you an example. William Grace was a decent enough candidate. He was a successful businessman, but the argument against him was that um, we can't let a Catholic be in control, as the New York Times put it in their editorial, because New York is an American Protestant city, okay? So um, supposedly William R. Grace was gonna turn over all the schools to the Pope and do all these, these terrible things. Um, and you, know, you may see echoes of things that happen today too uh, in, in, in all of this, this, uh, this, this uh, camp. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, the Irish were very defensive and the Italians came in desperately poor from the land of the Pope uh, considered by American sort of, uh, you know, uh, standards to be superstitious uh, in their religious practices. Um, and, and, and they were also Catholics. So the Irish were very eager to be accepted in America and to have their religion ex accepted, um, uh, were sort of responsible for the Italians, but also uh, at the same time, they were competing for jobs uh, as laborers 
and just the the you know uh, business liked it. They like having this source of cheap labor coming in. Uh, again, going back to the Times uh, uh, in an editorial, they said that um, they they liked the Italians coming because they were helping employers to reduce wages. Um, they said that Italians quote have nothing to do with trades unions. Um, and uh, um, they suggested that employers hire Italians freely since they were accustomed to low wages. Well, obviously the Irish did not like that. Um, the most powerful labor leader of the day, Terence Powderly of the Knights of Labor, he was a proud Irish American who raised money uh, to help Irish revolutionaries back home so they could try to fight the British. Uh, he also hated the Italians uh, because they were competing for, for jobs and they were sometimes hired as strike breakers by management. Um, later, uh, Powderly became the, the uh, US Immigration Commissioner in, uh, in 1898. Um, and he was always trying to figure out ways to stop this big migration from Italy and, and also from Eastern Europe. Um, literacy tests, um, uh, language requirements, um, how much money you had to have when you came in, came to the country. These kinds of you know proposals didn't just happen. They they were they were very much a part of what was going at the debate at the uh, beginning of the twentieth century. Um, just to give you a little illustration, uh, Powerly, let's see was at a congressional hearing. And there was one, he was the first Italian American congressman. His name was Frank Spinola. He was really Irish. He was half Irish and, and, and uh, you know, he, he, he played that up a lot. But I think somewhere in the back of his mind, he was offended at things that Terence Powderly was saying about Italians. So at a congressional hearing, held in New York on the so-called immigrant invasion. Um, he began questioning Powderly, who said that, you know, he thought Italians um, uh, were not the right class to become citizens. Uh, so Spinola tried to hit him with the one thing everybody knew about Italians who came to New York. They worked very hard, right? Uh, Spinola says, leaving that question entirely out, are they an industrious class of people as far as your observation goes? So Powderly replies, they work as a horse does. They are industrious in the same sense that a horse is because he is driven to it. Um, so, so, you know, e even that Powderly, uh, uh, you know, couldn't say anything good. Uh, and, Eventually, he says to the congressman, if he, meaning in Italian, knows, knows how to come, we have no objection. But he said that in a union, uh, it didn't matter where a worker came from, whether from Ireland or Scotland. So his argument was that Irish, Scottish, English, Welsh immigrants were just fit to be American citizens in a way that immigrants from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe we're not. Um, and and uh, when he became US immigration commissioner, uh, well, I'll leave, let me leave that and go on. Um, now, because of the competition for jobs, there were so many fights between Irish and Italian construction workers, for example, that in 1893, the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper ran an editorial that said, had the headline, can't they be separated? So their solution uh, to all these fights was to just keep Irish workers on one block and Italian workers on another block. Um, you would think that these two groups had a lot in common when you step back. They had the same religion and both were desperate you know, so desperate that they had to migrate. Um, they came mainly from uh, very poor rural areas, but even their shared religion 
became a battleground because inevitably the, the kind of gatekeeper, wherever you went, if you were Italian, was somebody who was Irish. So your foreman on the construction job was Irish. Your teacher in a Catholic school was Irish. Your priest was, was Irish. Um, your local politician was Irish, right? And um, uh, the Irish American pastors who headed, you know, priests who headed the different parishes uh, felt they had to keep the group separated um, because they got along so poorly. So they, they had the Italians do their religious services in the basement of the church instead of in the nice church upstairs. Um, and they thought the Italians didn't mind, but they really did. And this controversy about it echoed all the way uh, to the Vatican and Rome. Um, so these groups clashed in many different arenas, in the church, on construction sites, on uh, the waterfront, in unions, in the civil service, um, in the uh, legal system. Uh, I do a lot in the book on uh, police community relations because the police department was really Irish dominated uh, for a long time in New York. Um, and they did not understand the Italian community at all. The Italians spoke a different language. Uh, they, they were distrustful of, of police because of their experience with the authorities in their home country. Um, uh, and the, there were hardly any police who were, uh, who were from Italian background. And they were often blamed for things, uh, no matter what. Uh, um, um, and of course, they had the differences in politics and even among criminals, okay, uh, Irish gangs, Italian gangs would fight it out. Um, and I go into that a lot in the book, um, and it's pretty clear they did not get along. Um, so the question that's, I think, relevant for us uh, is, is what reconciled them after all these very deep differences? Um, I know I grew up hearing some of the stories about the differences between the Irish and the Italians. Um, and that's when I explored it, it, it would actually went much deeper and, uh, than, than I had ever known, you know, just from hearing things around. Um, first of all, I think it should be said, there are always people who did cross the barrier, even when the barrier was, was very strong. Um, some did it out of shrewdness. You know what? Criminals were pretty good at that because they're very practical. And if they, they could benefit from uh, uh, an alliance, they would do it. And uh, in the book, I focus on a particularly shrewd player uh, whose birth name was Paul Vaccarelli and later changed his name to Paul Kelly. And um, and, and a politician uh, named Big Tim Sullivan, who was a, uh, the, a boss of the Lower East Side for Tammany Hall and, and very powerful and very notorious for his connections to gamblers, prostitution and, and burlesque theaters. Okay. Um, so Vaccarelli, um, uh, as I said, was a notorious gangster who became a respectable labor leader in his later years. Um, as a young man, he became a boxer. And as boxers often did, uh, uh, later Frank Sinatra's father did this as a boxer, they took on uh, an Irish name, okay? So he, he went from Kelly to back, from Vaccarelli to Kelly. And he formed a sports club, uh, as they called it, but that was really a, a gang, criminal gang. Um, and Sullivan saw the possibilities in young Paul Kelly and, and used his gang for various purposes, such as uh, election fraud. Uh, Paul Kelly knew how to send out repeaters, people who went from one place to another voting, and, uh, and, um, and also violence, you know, to have a, a group of thugs around to help you in, in, in your political battles was, was another thing. Uh, and, and in return, Paul Kelly and his gang benefited from uh, Sullivan's protection, in it, especially with the police department and often with judges too. Um, 
after nearly getting killed in a gang war, uh, Paul Kelly changed careers and became head of a local union of Italian immigrants who worked on, on garbage uh, barges. Uh, and he parlayed this into uh, a vice presidency in the International Longshoremen's Union. Uh, and he led one of the biggest strikes, waterfront strikes in US history in uh, 1919. Um, uh, even though the union's leader, who was an Irish American, had, had opposed it. Uh, the uh, shrewd Paul Baccarelli, because he had changed his name back once he became an Italian labor leader, uh, said it because his parents wanted him to. Um, Paul Baccarelli um, managed to unite the Italian workers on the waterfront and the Irish workers who normally hated them. Uh, they hated each other. He managed to unite them because they were so they so much wanted a raise after, you know, being denied raises during the, the World War I years. And so he led this strike, closed down the port of New York, and, um, uh, and then the, the, the Irish head of the Union couldn't believe it when a man with Paul Vaccarelli's past as a gangster was appointed by the president to a mediation board that negotiated an end to the strike. Um, so as I said, you know, there, and, and there were people who were shrewd enough to overcome the divisions uh, to help themselves. And others did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, in that regard, I think of a woman I'd heard about when I was growing up. Um, my, my family uh, initially lived in uh, Amat Street in, in what we, you know, now it's sort of a touristy little Italy, but at one time there were a lot, of, you know, thousands and thousands of Italian immigrants living there. My, my aunt was born in 1911 in, in New York. Um, and she went to a uh, church uh, called Old St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's um, uh, in lower Manhattan, like uh, bound by Prince and Mott and Mulberry streets. Um, and that was, a uh, church run by an Irish pastor, but that was gradually realizing it had to bring the new Italian community of that neighborhood into the church. So she went to the uh, school, Old St. Pat's School, and she had glowing memories of a woman she called Sister Monica. Because Sister Monica, she was one of those nuns who really worked with the Italian, young Italian girls and, and you know, said, if you don't study, you're going to wind up working in the, you know, in the terrible garment factory. These, these girls were all born in the year that of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, right? Um, and, and the nuns would go out and visit Italian families that, you know, where the, if the kids weren't coming to school and, and they lived in terrible poverty and, and they would do what they could to, to, uh, to help them. So I looked up this, this person, Sister Monica, and I found out she become the principal sister Monica McInerney. And so she's one of the people who's going across the divide. Um, and another thing that happened was I found that sometimes people just learn that they were wrong in their judgments that they made initially about the other side. And, and one of these uh, kind of unbelievably was Terence Powderly who after his career as a uh, union leader, then immigration commissioner, um, got a chance to visit Italy. And I found his correspondence. Uh, I have copies of it at the Graduate Center in, in Manhattan. And um, he wrote about that, that trip to Italy, where he got to think a little bit more about how he treated the Italians in America. And he said, I learned to know these people by breaking bread with them in their homelands. And he decided that we have not done our duty by ourselves or by our country and not getting close enough to our immigrants to hear their heartbeats. If we thought they were wrong, we could not set them straight by remaining aloof from them. Pretty remarkable thing for uh, Terence Powderly to, uh, to say. There was also a, one of the uh, Irish American uh, priest pastors in, in Manhattan who was probably the one best known historically for his bad relations with the Italians in his church. Um, I found that 
years later, he was a priest at a parish, Catholic parish up in Washington Heights when they were building the subway. And if you've been, ever been on the subway way up there in Washington Heights, you know that it's very deep below the ground, right? Because Washington Heights is up on this, this ridge. It's not like most of the subway that's just under the surface of the city street. So a crew of Italian laborers led by an Irish foreman, which was typical, went into a, a deep uh, shaft in the ground to, um, you know, to plant some explosives. And the shaft crumbled on them, right? So this priest went deep under the ground and all these Italian laborers were pinned under rocks and dying and they couldn't be moved. And, and, and you know, he gave the, uh, the last rites, what Catholics call the last rites, that kind of last blessing before somebody dies under great, uh, in great danger because the, the, the shaft could have collapsed further any time. So he, he kind of emerged as a hero for at least what on that occasion he did for the, this, these Italian uh, Catholics in, in, in his work. Um, so, so there are examples of people who learned, maybe learned over time, uh, to see the humanity in these people who they once viewed as as a pest or as invaders, as you know, people to be stopped and kept away. Um, the um, church actually winds up playing an important role in bringing the Italians and Irish together. I'm not going to go into it now, but. The Italians and Irish had very different ways of practicing Catholicism, same religion, um, you know, under the Pope in Rome and all that stuff. But even the Pope in Rome meant very different things to them. Remember 1870, the Italians conquered Rome from the Pope. He was their enemy. To become a country, they had to go to war with the Pope. The Irish were very, had their, not their, their political identity, the national identity was very much wrapped around the Pope. Right, because he um, he is uh, uh, it's important to them to be Catholic. Their oppressors are Protestant, right? This is a you know divide that goes back centuries. So they were very supportive of the, of the Pope. They actually were young men in New York who went and joined what was called an Irish brigade that helped fight for the Pope against the Italians in Italy. Uh, so. So they have very different ways of being Catholic. Um, and, uh, and yet over time, because they were in this space together, uh, the church does play a role in uniting them uh, because we have to remember it's on the altars of Catholic churches where so many Irish Italian marriages take place in the years after World War II. Uh, studies show, the sociological data shows that the Italians who do not marry other Italians, and Italian family, there's kind of a, especially at that time, kind of a push to do that. But if they do not marry other Italians, they almost always married Irish partners. When I say Irish, I mean of Irish ancestry, right? Um, further, the data show that the Italians who married Irish partners were almost always churchgoers and Catholic school graduates. Um, so the church and its related schools, colleges, and social organizations did become a great meeting ground for these two groups eventually. Um, I think the bottom line about what brought these groups together is that the Irish and the Italians got to know each other. They mingled with each other in the very same place, places where they'd once been in open conflict in the workplace, in church, in unions, in other associations, in politics, in the civil service. Um, one key factor, I think also, is not only did they mingle, I think this is important, they begin to mingle more as equals because Italians over time begin to overcome the poverty that they, 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 they experienced for decades. Um, and, and, and move up to be equals in the workplace. Um, it's not just economic, being equal economically. I think there's also kind of a cultural equality. Um, for Italians, I think it was a turning point that Italian Americans like Frank Sinatra and Joe DiMaggio became cultural heroes. Um, if you know about 
Sinatra, you know, during, well, during the war, um, he would give concerts and all the teenaged girls would swoon and uh, over Frank Sinatra, right? Those are the same, same young women who crossed the barrier for all these intermarriages, okay? Uh, so that, that was kind of, you know, I, I was trying to find turning points. Um, and when, when this kind of Irish-Italian rivalry started to turn, and I found the 40s was really kind of it. We also see it in politics where Italians uh, aren't actually vote for an Irish American uh, politician, William O'Dwyer, over one of their own, uh, Fiorella LaGuardia, one of the city's great mayors, I think. But um, in his last, LaGuardia always had that vote and the Jewish vote, and the Irish did not like him because he, 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 he defeated their organization, the Democratic organization, Tammany Hall. But um, uh, so when I see the Irish, the Italians vo voting for an Irish, so, uh, and Edouard was born in Ireland, um, and eventually the Italians are making their impact in, in politics felt at that point. They, it, take, it took a while. Um, uh, I also like to think about food. Um, let's see. Uh, just for a little fun, it might be said that the increasing popularity of pizza in New York City paralleled the rise of Irish-Italian marriages. Like the Italian immigrants who brought it, pizza was looked upon with some reserve in New York in the early 1900s. Quote, pie has usually been considered a Yankee dish exclusively but apparently the Italian has invented a kind of pie, a New York Tribune writer commented in 1903, trying to explain the pomodoro pizza or tomato pie made from dough rolled, out, dough rolled out with plenty of pepper on top. The pizza's perceived spiciness was cause for suspicion. Another article, a Jason article carried the headline, do fiery foods cause fiery natures? Italian love for red peppers may explain the combativeness of spirit of men of that nation. They were very eager in that era to, to uh, take a whole nationality and, and, and uh, characterize it. Uh, they even believed, as you may know, that the shape of people's skulls determined you know, all kinds of things about their, their, their nationality. Anyway. Um, Two years later, Gennaro Lombardi opened a pizzeria on Lower Manhattan Spring Street. They still have one. Uh, pizza was popular among Italian immigrants, but took a while to catch on elsewhere in the city. As late as 1939, the Herald Tribune's food columnist treated pizza as almost as foreign to most New Yorkers' tastes. Quote, if someone suggests a pizza pie after the theater, don't think it's going to be a wedge of apple, Clementine Paddleford wrote. It's going to be the surprise of your life. Um, I think during World, War, during World War II, canned spaghetti that was fed to the troops became popular. And I think introduced a lot of Americans to spaghetti. Uh, in any case, uh, Irish Americans were far ahead of the British in their knowledge of spaghetti. On April Fool's Day in 1957, the BBC pulled off one of the most famous television hoaxes ever by running a documentary that purported to show how spaghetti grew on trees. Many people in the United Kingdom fell for it. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, where Dean Martin uh, sings the song when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's Amore. Yes. You've seen it, yes, okay, yes. yeah. Well, think of that scene where he is walking around with a loving Italian family, uh, dishing out, you know, uh, bowls of uh, pasta, fazool, as he would say, pasta fagioli, pasta with beans. Um, and that's very different from the way Italians were depicted in movies before World War II. They were, al they were almost always either shifty criminals 
or total country bumpkins, right? Um, and and um, so that's and when I talk about the cultural side of it, I think that's that's a factor uh, too. After World War II, um, the old ethnic enclaves in Manhattan were starting to break up. People moved out of Little Italy at little, and um, they moved to the suburbs or residential areas of the city like where I live in Marine Park, Brooklyn. Um, uh, their, their kids, you know, played, played ball together and, you know, and, and went to school together. Uh, my own family, uh, the Italian side, uh, moved from Mott Street to, uh, to Bay Ridge. Um, and of course, I, you know, I did hear plenty of stories about ethnic taunting uh, that they met when they were in the minority in, uh, in Bay Ridge. Um, I have a late aunt uh, who I interviewed when she was well into her 90s. Uh, she liked to say, I got even with the Irish, I married one. Um, now, um, so as the Irish and Italians mingled as equals in a variety of areas where they had once fought, they got to know each other and even to like each other and to fall in love. What all this means to me is that if it was possible for the Irish and Italians to overcome that enmity between them, to make peace and even find romance and love, it means that it's possible the other ethnic or racial friction we see in today's society uh, will, can also be overcome. Um, it's peacemaking from the grassroots, one human connection at a time. And I don't know, I just think your, your idea of Peace Islands Institute, that we can each be an island of peace, uh, it, it just seems to be uh, exactly uh, what can happen. Um, I don't wanna minimize the obstacles especially on, on the racial division we, we see in our country, uh, which seems so historically uh, rooted. Um, but I do think that over time, it's possible for longstanding boundaries to blur and even to fade away if we get to know each other as individuals one at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, if I may take a uh, moderator privilege and ask the first question. Of course, we talk about a, uh, a current polarity uh, in the United States uh, that could be political, cultural, race, uh, faith, I think, at, at the different levels. Are there lessons for the white American population from the Italian-Irish experience, or is that too complicated to make? to make, uh, to draw parallels, or maybe a subset of that question, uh, and you can answer either or both, uh, the issues that new and emerging communities, migrant communities, mm -hmm. like, is, is there advice you can provide? I, I think there is. Um, in terms of race, um, there's, a, there's a sociologist who actually wrote a, a book that looks at and he himself, as I, as I found out after uh, uh, he, he contacted me about what I had written, uh, Richard Alba, um, he was at CUNY Graduate Center, uh, when, uh, and, and he turned to be half Irish and half Italian uh, in ancestry. Um, he examined the question of, of whether this, this experience that occurred among the uh, European, you know, ethnic white ethnic uh, groups that came in the uh, 19th and first half of 20th centuries uh, could apply today. And he's, he's very cautious about it. He, he thinks one, uh, one important, he felt that at the time he wrote the book, he felt that uh, a strong economy is, is an important factor because it, it, it kind of eliminates some of the tensions that, that fall around competition for, for jobs. Uh, when I told you about the editorial in the Brooklyn Eagle, why can't, they, why can't we separate the workers? That was 1893 when there was a, a, a panic in the economy. Work was harder to find. Um, and he, he talks about, uh, he thought that the retiring of the baby boom generation would also create openings that would ease the job market situation in a way that, you know, 
limited the, this feeling of competition for jobs. Um, so in some sense, when the economy was really strong before COVID and baby boomers were retiring, that was really the scenario. I, I, it was in maybe a, a missed chance. Uh, um, but um, I think the basic premise that, that as people get to know each other, it it makes it it will make a difference. I think I think it's true, and if we if you look at data for interracial marriages and living together, right? I I, I haven't done a full. I'm not a sociologist, but I, um, when I worked on the book, I I looked at at some of it, and I was very interested. At that time, Arizona was a big hot spot for um, uh, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. They were passing laws. They had Sheriff Joe, who was, you know, locking up anybody he could find. And um, but yet there was substantial interracial, the substantial marriage and cohabitation uh, between uh, Latino and uh, white non-Latino couples. Um, and no, that that's going off like census data from like around two thousand from two thousand ten, um, and so it's not a surprise to me that the politics of that state has changed, because people are just there's something going on. I'm not an Arizonan, but people are mixing and they're having children together, and and there are just divides there. 15 years ago that are, are gradual, uh, that are changing. So I, I, you know, I think you can make a case that it, it's impossible, it's possible for things that look very difficult to bridge that they can be. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. I've got uh, questions now from our audience. Great. Uh, Joe, uh, R Riteco asks, can you see, can you say more about the transition versus time by the 1950s, per my experience as an Italian in an Irish neighborhood, the issue was history. Did World War II play a part? Uh, how about sports? I think World War II definitely played a part um, in, a, in a number of ways. One is just that uh, people uh, were, were in, in service together um, and and sometimes had to rely on each other for their lives. Um, uh, also, World War One, there we we kind of associate with the the kind of Irish gaining acceptance in American society in, in some ways. I think World War Two is important for the Italians. They were. Italy was an enemy of the United States in World War II. Um, and so they kind of start out a little on shaky ground there in, in terms of how they're, they're perceived. Uh, but many, many, you know, many people served and, 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 and quite well in a, in a lot of cases. Um, so I think that that is important. So it's on both, on two levels, the how, how the larger society perceives the Italian community and, and then and then just individual relationships that formed. And then uh, sports also, uh, again, two levels. Uh, I already talked about sports in the neighborhood. Uh, but um, it, sports is very interesting to follow uh, how different groups take their place in the sun, essentially. And, and for Italians, um, uh, it really begins uh, with the, the New York Yankees bringing in, uh, I mentioned DiMaggio, but before DiMaggio, they had ball players like Tony Lazzari and Frank Crescetti, and, and um, uh, then they had Yogi Berra later on, Phil Rizzuto. Uh, the Yankees were quicker to hire, hire uh, Italian American ball players than others were, and they benefited from that. Um, later, other teams like the Dodgers were quicker to hire uh, African American ball players. And they benefited from that. And then later, you, we see uh, Latino ball players coming into their own, uh, and and now uh, Asian 
um, so, um, so yeah, I do think sports is, is a factor too, in terms of sports heroes, uh, and also just kids playing ball together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We've got a, uh, another question here now. Uh, this is from uh, Sally Ujel. Uh, greetings from Melbourne. And I assume that's Melbourne, Australia, of course. Did such rivalry happen between uh, two ethnic groups in other cities in the US and other countries such as in Australia? I'm not, I'm really not familiar with Australia. It seems to be, you know, part of the human condition in a lot of ways. Um, I, uh, I think in the US, it's somewhat shaped by the size of the communities. So if it's really in a small, if one is really a much smaller community, it, I, I, I don't think you find that same kind of, of, uh, of a rivalry. So in- Someone in, mentioned Boston to me, for example. Yeah. Similar ethnic breakup, but I, I don't know the numbers. I, I think it's there, but the Italian community compared to the Irish community is much smaller. In, in Boston, in, 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 in New York, they were both very large, uh, large communities um, over time. Uh, so, it, so I think that's a factor that makes it different. But um, I, I'll give you an example. I, I was trying to, when I was teaching at Brooklyn College, I'm, I'm retired from there now, I was trying to tell one of the, my students about this thing with Irish and Italians. And they, they like, my student was one of those people who just consider them as, you know, sort of a white Catholic group, you know. Um, and, uh, and so finally she says to me, oh, you mean like the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans? I said, yes, okay, that we have ethnic rivalries too um, among um, uh, groups uh, coming to New York now. Um, uh, so uh, yes to the gentleman in, in Melbourne, I, I, I would say, um, we do see this playing out every which which way. And uh, Hoshina Zen asks, when Italians and Irish marry, which cult culture did the couples follow? I have a few chapters in the book about that. Uh, well, food generally went the Italian way. I will say that. Um, they have religious differences. The Irish person is normally the... Um, uh, the more strictly observant Catholic, not always, but that, that, that was uh, um, the general thing. Um, and there's different ways of, of being a family also that I found out actually really matter. Um, so their uh, family therapists use a textbook on, uh, on ethnicity to help them understand the di differences between different ethnic groups. Um, even families that are relatively, you know, assimilated in, in, in the United States, second, third generation, it, it's still a, uh, a factor. Um, and it plays out in, in data. You know, you can see it, it they know that Italian American families are um, much more likely to see grandma on Saturday and live within five blocks, okay, um, than Irish families are. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't mean, this doesn't mean it, it's everybody, but, but that, that's the tendency. So, so there are things to, to work out. Uh, how do you deal with grief? Do you keep it in? Do you express it? Um, th these are all cultural things that, that, that do exist. We, 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 it's, it's sometimes forgotten. It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, Hassan Aslan asks, uh, the Irish had the advantage of speaking English. Did this help them to climb the uh, ethnic societal ladder easier than Italians in American uh, society? Uh, yes, uh, I think they, they, be, they, they became middle class uh, faster. Um, I, I, I think, uh, speaking, uh, coming in, speaking English, all the more, more than you might think came in speaking only Gaelic. Uh, but yes, I think that was a, um, a, a big advantage. Um, and so an Irish middle-class does begin to develop fairly quickly. Um, but some, I think sometimes people forget how, how poor the Irish remained 
right into the 20th century, how, how there was a lot of poverty still. Um, and to me, it's important to remember that because it partly explains the reaction to the Italians. It wasn't like the Italians came in and uh, every Irish person who was carrying bricks on the construction site was now a bricklayer. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not like everybody raised up. It was a little messier than that. And that is why part of the reason for the, uh, for the, for the bad feelings. Got another, another question. Uh, and this may be our final question. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, Irish immigrants started to seek jobs within the government state structures as eldermen, mayors, police officers, uh, etc. Did this create any kind of tension for the Italians who already had a huge mistrust towards the state considering the purge of Mussolini? Yeah. Um, the uh, Initially... The um, Italians were mostly content to just kind of go with the flow. A, a Tammany Hall like politician like Big Tim Sullivan, he would give out all kinds of free stuff to Italian families. My Aunt Marie, who I mentioned earlier, she used to say, the first time I ever sat in a patch of grass was because of Tammany Hall. They took her on a bus trip out of, away from Mott Street, right? Um, they, uh, um, so... For a good long time, the the uh, I, they were pretty good politicians, and and they they you know they would give Italians low level jobs, you know, street cleaning department, and you know, not much, but but it it, it seemed to work um, for quite a while. At a certain point, the Italians looked around and said, "Well, why is there almost everybody in my street Italian, but my you know local assemblyman is." Is Irish, and they started to think that's true, and then it was there was there was a, took a while for power to turn over. It was it was quite a battle. Um, but I'm not sure if I answered the question. Uh, we've got maybe one. This seems like a short question, so I'll uh, I beg your patience, uh, Paul. I love, it. Uh, I love it. What does Black Irish mean? And, and they've got a comment after notorious Tammany Hall uh, political machine. I'm not too sure if that relates. I, I to only know. I, I only know. I, I, first of all, I don't have a drop of Irish blood, so uh, I, I don't know if I can speak on the meaning of the term Black Irish. I've always understood it just to be uh, Irish. Are actually can be pretty diverse because they've traveled all over the place, right? And 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 so there are uh, Irish who are certainly dark haired and, and dark eyed and and. I always thought it to, to mean that. Um, uh, 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 but as for Tammany Hall, uh, yeah, the, the, the Irish controlled that from like, uh, I don't know, 1870. They were helpful to Boss Tweed. After Boss Tweed left, departed, uh, they controlled that from 1870 right into the 19, uh, up, to, up, up to whenever Carmine Pisapio took over. 1950 was the turning year. All three candidates for mayor of New York were not only Italian, but born in Italy. Uh, so that was kind of a turning point. But um, there's one more thing I thought I, I should mention was I just, the anti-immigrant feeling that did develop, those things that Terence Powderly tried to start, they really took hold in the 1920s. And that's why US immigration law largely excluded much migration, certainly from Italy, Eastern Europe, uh, until the law was changed in 1965. And in some ways, we're in a, a parallel period now where the percentage of the foreign-born population is, is, is higher again, and you do see people trying, uh, once again, uh, nativist movements uh, that, um, that are a powerful force in, in society. So there's, there's kind of a... Um, you know, uh, continuity there. Um, you know, I think this the story myself, the lesson for me is that um, these immigrant communities then and, and now uh, tremendously revitalize the country. Um, but, you know, the battle, you know, continues about that. On that note, 
Paul, I want to thank you for joining us today. And of course, to everyone watching uh, today, thank you for participating. Thank you for your questions. I've shared various links in the chat box. There's a link to uh, Paul's book as well. And there it is. And uh, there's a promotion, actually. The, for some reason, they're offering the, um, the, the e-book on all the platforms, Kindle, whatever, whatever, for $1.99 till the end of the month. I should mention that. I'd rather, just, I'd, I'd rather just spend the big bucks for the, for the paperback, but $1.99 it is. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so uh, the link uh, to the book is in the chat. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, uh, please give this video a thumbs up. If you're first time here, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, there's various links in the description. Subscribe to our email and, of course, follow us on social media. I want to thank uh, Paul again. Uh, thank you very much. And everyone, until next time, uh, be well and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you.